guys can hug and howdy, love on her neighbor. Sorry about that, John. I turned it on, but I forgot to wait the five-second delay in there. Uh, please, please, please uh, share your appreciation with Aria and Gigi. That is just pretty cool, you know, that they, I mean, they're not even up here. But I'm just saying, pat them on the back and tell them, because they've uh, been doing the uh, fusion on Sunday nights. And really, I guess, John, probably it was at least mid-year last year before they ever, they'd done it a few times and helped, right? But Henry finally just said, you know, I'm going to let you guys take it on over and and now they're missing a couple of the uh, senior high kids that were also Jer uh, Jacob and I don't know who all else was helping out, uh, Rachel. So that's pretty brave of him, but Henry had some stuff come up tonight. He couldn't be free, so uh, I just thought, man, that's so cool. And you ought to be very thankful that I didn't have to step up and lead worship. <laughs> or Keith, you know, and I mean, we could do a duet, all right, but it would be a solo. You would not want to be singing. But uh, glad that you're here tonight. Thank God for the safety and the storms and the rain and everything that way. But uh, my grass looks like the best, it, or looks the best it ever has. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, uh, and you know what I forgot? My glasses. I might not need them. Maybe we'll see. I don't usually use them. It's just I hate when I get in the middle of stuff. It just makes it a little bit clearer. But you all look a lot better tonight without them. So uh, it makes the crowd look fuzzy, big, and everything, you know. But uh, anyway, we're going to go back to Exodus and maybe wrap up chapter 14 this evening. Uh, not trying to run it into the ground, uh, trying to run it into the Red Sea like the uh, guys end up being run into the ground. Thank you, Keith. Very kind of you. Um, but the whole purpose of looking at this is so that, um, I, you know, I hope it becomes so familiar to you that you don't forget. Uh, because the people, the children of Israel, the people that were a part of this forgot. Uh, it's just, this, it's not their memory, it's just their God. And it's the same way with us, that uh, we kind of do our own thing and we're pretty self-sufficient. And so we entertain ourselves and a variety of other things. But man, I mean, when it gets your backs against the wall, then you cry out to God, right? Otherwise, you'll take things in stride. 
And I'm not saying that any of you have ever said that to me, but I've actually had people tell me that, you know, well, God needs to help those people out that really need him. Right now I'm doing just fine. And uh, I don't pray to God because I just don't want to bother him much, you know. And it's like you've missed the whole thing. It's not about bothering God. It's about the relationship, and it's the greatness of being able to have that relationship with him that you share good and bad, thick and thin, whatever in between, so that you get used to the fact that he's there. But it's also, at the very least, I think we ought to be those that are smart enough that we don't forget what he's already done. But we do. And it's like I was telling somebody the other night, it's just so funny about life itself, how if you owe somebody money, uh, you can forget that, you know, I mean, in the sense that it's like, oh, I mean to and I will, but if somebody owes you, you think about it a lot, right? I mean, that's just kind of the, the way of the world, so to speak, is you're very much aware that, well, they said they would pay me. It's now been a week late that they haven't paid me yet. When are they going to pay me? And you just keep running that over and over in your mind. Well, I think I'm pretty glad that God probably doesn't do that with us because we are continually in debt to him. And the idea being is, I mean, if we only took the highlights reel of our life, I think most of us have already forgotten it. But if we took it and uh, just lived accordingly in the sense of the everyday things that we face, if we just trusted God with those things like we do looking back and seeing him intervene in some of the larger ways, I think that we would be better off. In other words, here with uh, Revelation or with uh, Exodus 14, sorry about the Revelation deal there. But if, uh, if God saves our tails like this, imagine what he can do with our soul. And at the same time, if God can save our souls like we believe he did through Jesus Christ, imagine what he could do with our tails or our everyday life. And I'm just saying that we could live a whole lot more victoriously than sometimes we allow ourselves to. And what keeps us from being victorious and keeps us from that, I think number one is that lack of relationship. And number two is just... Quite honestly, we struggle to remain thankful. I didn't hear any amens, but I think we struggle to remain thankful. And it's like it really does get back to, well, what have you done for me lately? So let's pray, okay? God and Father, tonight, not trying to be a downer in any way, but just trying to be an exalter of you. That, Lord, even just like the songs that we sang, and even though it wasn't Henry's voice, it's more in my key. God, I thank you for not only the girls' effort, I mean, for what they did and I can't imagine, Lord, I mean, it's one thing to sing in front of your peers, but another thing in front of the adults, but they did. But, Lord, it's not just that they sang, and it's not just that one played the guitar and the other, um, you know, hit the keyboard. God, instead, it's the fact that they sang about you, and that's why they had the courage. It wasn't about anything other than that. They believed that you're worth singing to and worshiping, and thank you, Lord, for their willingness to lead me, at least, and to sing some songs that I'm not as familiar with as maybe what I ought to be, but, Lord, the words there about you and Jesus, about you and giving to you and surrendering to you, and I just humbly thank you for the reminders. And I do believe that you're a God that's worth bowing down to, and I just don't bow enough. And it's not that we have to even. It's not that our knees absolutely have to be bent to be able to pray, and I thank you for the freedom that we have in that. It's just sometimes it's healthy that we do bend our knees. We go back to being like little children kneeling beside the bed before we get in it for the night. That, Lord, that we bend our knee because you're a God that is worth bowing down to. And that we don't forget to count our many blessings in all the different ways, God, and including those major ones of giving us our life and our breath and everything else. But I think somewhere along the line, Lord, all of us have had that near-death experience. And if it wasn't just uh, each individual that's here, it's somebody that was very close to us and then we prayed and you intervened. I thank you, God, as a church, that we've seen you answer numerous prayers. I mean, numerous and severe situations in people's lives. And God, it's what propels me to not take lightly, whether it's to just not pray only for the people I know, but even these other requests that come in for people that we don't know. Is God, I've received blessings from you because of people across this United States and possibly around the world that have prayed for me. And so I'm humbled by that. But God, I don't want to forget how you work, how strong you are, how you show yourself strong, not just miraculous, but God, your unbelievable abilities to to guard and guide us, Lord, if we'll just release to you. And so I pray, help and dwell upon our memories, God, not that we should even ask you, but might we be better about keeping track of that, the God who saves, the God who is able. And so, Lord, once again, as we watch through the words of Moses, but see in our minds that whole thing of the enemy approaching and parting the Red Sea, but walking on dry ground. God, just how cool are you? And I pray that we would leave tonight, God, lifting you up and 
and having that holy and healthy fear of you. That, Lord, that as we, as we live believing that we are victorious and not only have been but will be, that our friends and neighbors and, Lord, those that don't believe might watch and they come to fear you as well. Not because they see us scared to death, but they see that holy, reverent fear that you are worthy of. So, God, I pray that you would guide my teaching and their hearing. And, and by that, what I mean is, God, it's, I just never know whether it's the gift of speaking or it's far more the gift of hearing. And, Lord, help my ears to hear, even while my mouth is speaking, that I would be filled and challenged, Lord, and fed. That, God, that I would be touched, as you so often do, by things that I needed to stop and to think about. That, Lord, that not only would I not give up, but that, Lord, with your power and strength and the help of my brothers and sisters here, that we'd all be overcomers and that we'd be welcomed into your kingdom and not just allowed to come in, but welcomed with those words, well done, good and faithful. So, Lord, lead us toward that good and faithfulness, I pray. Speak to us from heaven, God. Challenge us, correct us, teach us, lead us, encourage us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in the book of Exodus chapter 14, not going to read the whole thing. Like I said, I know we've covered it several times, though, and, and, and I just love it. And so I'll try to work, work briskly through this. And I know last week I touched on there's a couple things that I want to bring to you out of the book of James. But as we approach again, verse 10, as Pharaoh approached the Israelites, looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified. They cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt you brought us here? That fatalistic, oh my, you know. And uh, what have you done bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to have served the Egyptians than to die in the desert. And so that very fatalistic giving up, there's just not much depth to their faith. It's like the story of the sower and the seed, then uh, one of the seeds that fell on the hard path, the devil came and snatched it before it could even do anything, like the birds would snatch up a seed on the sidewalk. Then the next one was it was in soil, but it was shallow soil because underneath was rock. And so the seed, it said, sprang up quickly with joy, but then it wilted at the moment of any kind of, you know, pressure. And uh, the moment of any kind of trial, it fell away. And that that's where many people are. And then the other seed that was in good soil, but it was in the midst of the weeds, it sprang up and it grew, but it never produced any fruit because the weeds kept zapping it. And I think that's where many Christians tend to live is that we're still in the world, so to speak. And I don't mean we have to become anything from, and I don't mean this sarcastically, but the Amish picture or Quaker type thing, whatever. I'm not saying that we even have to do that. It's, it's not that we can't have anything that the world does, but it's not allowing the world to control us or to be what we live for, but rather instead we live for God. But otherwise we'll be fruitless. The world will get our best time and our energies and our money. And what's left will just be the leftovers that we give to God and we hope to get our, you know, uh, suck it up big time on Sundays and take it home and live the rest of the week on it. But um, that's what the seeds it says. But then there was one group that Jesus really was amazed at and they were the ones that produced from the seed that they received 10, 20, 30, even 100 fold. In other words, they took whatever God gave them and they magnified it and multiplied it to share with others. Well, as I look here, the Israelites are still pretty much in that secondary type thing of where they believe in God as long as it's working, but as soon as it doesn't work the way that they thought it would work. And so I do want to look at this working thing tonight, but we read on, Moses answered the people, don't be afraid, stand firm, you'll see the deliverance of the Lord that the Lord will bring you today. And folks, those words might have been to them back then, and it might have been about a particular army that was approaching, but those words are still for you and me today. The deliverance he brought us from our own sins and from ourself the deliverance he brings us from Satan and even the habits that we've had, that he will, not just a snap of the fingers instantaneously, but like these folks, it's something as we begin to walk and we walk away from what we've known, there will be times it would be easier to return, but what we need to do is continue on believing in his promise and that he can deliver. And that's what his promise is here. He said, man, stand firm. You'll see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. When you begin growing weary about something not being instantaneously, I want to encourage you, stand firm. When it seems like God's doing nothing, I want to encourage you, stand firm. That, you know, one of the most amazing things to me is, and talk about forgetting about the past, it just still so gets me at times when suddenly it, it connects in my mind and I realize that something either has taken place or is taking place that was something that I prayed about maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years ago. God never forgot. He was waiting for me to be ready to receive. God was working things to good, but, you know, there are some prayers he can't answer until we're ready for the next step. And I think we sometimes forget that we even prayed them. And if you forgot you prayed them, you don't even remember to thank him when you see that it's happened or when you know that you've grown. Sometimes people pray for patience, and what, what's God give you? 
challenges and trials and things that will earn the patience. So it's not that we earn them. It's just that he with us will build them, that we'll begin to realize there's no sense. There's nothing gained getting frustrated. There's nothing gained cursing. There's nothing gained throwing hammers at things. There's nothing gained by, oh, the world's falling apart, you know, and chicken little, the sky is falling. Nothing gained by that. But what it's gained by is when we endure and we realize and go, wow, man, I can either approach this nasty situation by, you know, losing it, so to speak, and, you know, our head and being the chicken with the head cut off. Or I can go ahead and say, God, I don't like this situation. I hope that we can go through this rather rapidly here, but I want to praise you in the midst of it. And guess which one will work out better? Every time, the one where we give God thanks and we praise him for it, and we continue to look to do what we can do for others. And the next thing you know, it's like, wow. And so the next crisis that comes up isn't near as big a crisis because you learn God works things out. God will work through this. I just need to hold on to God. And like the little song says, you know, if you're going through hell, keep on walking, right? Don't stop. There's no reason to stop in the midst of it. And sometimes we bail on God. And we're like these folks. So Moses said, no, man, God will deliver. Just wait on him. You'll see it. The Lord will bring you this. And the truth of the matter was he already had, right? In numerous ways with the plagues and everything, especially the last one, he'd already delivered. Why, what, what is it going to take for them to get to believe that he will always deliver? Maybe not their way, but his way. But nonetheless, he told them a promise. I'm going to take you the promise. And they're not even close yet. And they're afraid that God's going to just let them be wiped out by all of Pharaoh's army. And it's like, God didn't promise you you'd be wiped out. God promised that he wanted to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, a land that you didn't cultivate, that you didn't build the houses or plant the vineyards. He wants to give that to you. He'd already told them that. And the reason I mention this is because if we can, what's really wise is when we learn from other people's mistakes, right? So what are the promises that God's given you? What promises has he got in the word? Promises in a variety of ways, and we need to believe in them alike, not just grabbing the ones that we think we want, not the Christianity cafeteria style, and I'll just have dessert, but I'll have some vegetables, and I'll go ahead and eat some stuff that I might not like because it's good for me, you know, type of thing. But God, I want to take all of your promises and trust them because you're the God that never lies. And Satan is a liar, and as we looked Monday night with the guys group, the father of all lies. And so Moses says, you'll see the deliverance, and it'll be today. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. So that means either they're going to go blind or their guys are going to be get, gotten rid of. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm not telling you to be still, Moses. Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff. Stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I'll harden the heart of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I'll gain glory through Pharaoh and all of his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I'm the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now, Mary Jo asked last week if Pharaoh died in this, and I think it really lends itself that he probably did. Because as you read earlier in 14 there, he's the one that was irritated, and he's the one that talked to his other guys that, come on, we need to go get him, get the best of my chariots, and he's the one that went with them. Now, what becomes difficult is reading with the pronouns, when is it Pharaoh's army and when is it Pharaoh and his army? It doesn't all speak real clear. And obviously, I would almost guess that even though all of them were destroyed, all of them that rode in, The king or Pharaoh may have stood back and watched the battle is what a lot of times the generals and the kings would do, right? And somebody had to go back and tell the Egyptians what happened to everybody else. But uh, it says here that he wiped them all out. So nonetheless, anyway, God's purpose, I want the Egyptians to know I'm the Lord. And uh, I want to gain glory through this. So the angel of the Lord had been traveling with them uh, in front of Israel's army, withdrew, went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved in front and stood behind them or that had stood in front, moved behind them. Coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel, throughout the night the cloud brought darkness to one side, light to the other. So neither went near the other all night. And so in it, I believe that what God was doing, kind of the story, like I said, it doesn't necessarily unfold and unwind totally chronological. It kind of jumps back and forth. But you got to remember, Moses wrote this, and he didn't write it at the time, and he's already in his 80s. So I don't know how old he was when he finally sat down and started writing, you know. But he wrote this down, and so it's, it's kind of that thing how God will do that, bringing thoughts to our minds and all. And I know that as a preacher speaking, that that's why I'm not necessarily congruent and totally uh, just smooth and easy to follow. But there's, it's just like so many things that jump into my mind that I see in the scriptures that I, I want to share with you. And I think that's kind of what Moses does here. Is, and he's closing out one thought as he does another, plus the fact that we're just not Hebrews like they were. 
Hebrew Egyptian, so to speak, you know, where they'd had some of the schooling of the Egyptians. So it may be even the way they told their stories. I don't know. But so a lot of this is happening kind of at the same time. It's kind of like the book of Revelation where it's not chronological per se. There are parts of it that are, but a lot of it's overlapped or it's looking through just a different viewfinder, you know, so to speak, looking at a, a different angle of the same plane or the same picture. And so as Moses is writing this, what I see revealed here is, you know, Jesus moving back, and I believe at least the angel of the Lord, and he moves back to protect their backside and stand between, you know, the oncoming Egyptians and the Israelites. Moses is extending his hand and parting the waters, as God told him to do, quit crying out to me and start doing something. And so he's extending. So this pillar of cloud that seemed like it was one thing at one time and a pillar of fire at the other, now it's split down the middle. And so it's being a pillar of cloud of darkness to... Uh, you know, darken what's going on over here with the Egyptians, but over here with the Israelites, it's being a pillar of fire to light up the night so that they can see Moses standing there and suddenly watch water do what they've never seen it done, what you and I've never seen it done, is it begins to part. And not only does it part, but this wind, this huge wind comes in and drives it, as all the while it's drying it out. And I, I just think he would be standing there almost like, you know, with the Wizard of Oz going, oh my, you know watching but this light lighting it up no electricity no leds just god's light isn't that cool of him that he would want them to be able to see there's no hocus pocus there's no uh the wizard of oz behind the curtain here it's just god saying let me show you my fullness at least a part of it here folks let me get your attention look at this watch this and so he uses moses and Moses' faithfulness in spite of his weakness and disabilities, he uses Moses, and Moses just follows through with this simple obedience, and God responds with action. And so as he extends, and this begins to take place, and, and I just can't imagine, you know, it's one thing to watch a movie, it's another thing to be in it. But it's no trickery, it's not David Copperfield, it's not uh, smoke and mirrors. This is God just absolutely doing what can't be done naturally or normally. And the reason he could do it was because he's the one that put the waters in place. The scriptures clearly say that, that he set the boundaries. And Job, it even talks about that he set the quantities of water that there would be. It's not an accident that this earth is three-fourths water, nor that basically our body is about the same. But, you know, Moses was able to do this on behalf of God, just a small part, but because of his obedience, God enacted. And he's trying to get across to the, to the Israelites the same thing that he really wants to get across to you and me. And guess what that is? I'm crazy about you guys. Why don't you make it easy? Let's go together. Come on. I'll fight for you. I'll deliver you. And they're going, I'll have to wait and see about that. And we say, well, I don't want to go to hell, so I'll take some of this. But I just don't know about this everyday life stuff. God, I don't really think you know what you're doing. Oh, we never would say that out loud. We just act it when we go ahead and do our own thing instead of even seeking him. Or when we weigh out something, say, hey, it's not worth it. I'm going to do what I want to do. I can't afford to do what God wants me to do. Or I don't think I'd like that. Or, you know, that can't be me because I could never do that. I mean, it's, it's the same thing. And all I'm saying is, next time you face one of those things, just ask yourself, am I looking at the dark side or the bright side? Am I the enemy that God's barring or am I in the light that he's trying to show me the way? Because these folks had something to learn. And it was God saying, man, look, I'm doing this for you. I could have done it the easy way. I want a little drama. It makes life far more exciting. And we're as bad as a teenager. Man, we get bored so quick, don't we? Monday, and what happened today? Oh, nothing. Same old, same old. And yet, you change it up. Like the, the Molnar family and what they faced with the loss of a 22-year-old son. You beg for normal. Um, found out yesterday, a family we were very close to that uh, after we moved away, moved down here, that um, and Beth was already facing some things, but she, she died of brain cancer. And uh, two just uh, teenage girls, you know, no mama. And uh, her older sister was killed this uh, last weekend. And so it's just her and dad now. Now, Jay's remarried. I'm not taking anything away from that, but... Uh, of what was originally a family of four early in life now. Man, two tragedies striking close by there and uh, been in touch with them. 
they'd beg for a little bit of normal. And I think with each of us, we've all had those times when, you know, you kind of get into the mundane thing and it's suddenly like then so something changes up and you're like, oh man, I'd give anything to go back the way it used to be. So it's important that we, I think, have our heads about us and we don't allow emotions and feelings to run our lives or the world and what we think it is. And whether it's the paranoia, what's going on in Ferguson or what's happening in Israel or what's happening, you know, with the guy that uh, they, the ISIS took his head off, you know. And, and, and man, my heart goes out to all those families across the board. And I'm not saying we should be careless about it. And I could care less. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, like we talked Monday night, though, we've got to be careful. Because some of us have this tendency to, instead of being able to look at something and see it, pray about it and go on, we have to jump into it. You know, and one of the problems they're having in St. Louis now is people coming in from all over, not only news reporters, but people joining in on this protesting and the other part of it. And it's like, man, last I knew I don't really have a dog in the fight, you know? Why would I be going there? But see, the devil likes to wind us up so that we're, we're already stressed out, man. And then we wonder why we shout at our spouse or our kids because when well, you're wound up with all this stuff that's going on, everything's out of control, right? And the biggest thing I'd ask you then is the only thing you've really got control about is you and Jesus. And have you got control of your kids? <laughs> you think you do, right? Every once in a while you get a piece of them, but now I don't have full control, right? It's like somebody says, you think you're big stuff? Try bossing somebody else's dog around and see how important you are. You know, dogs don't oftentimes respond to somebody else telling them what to do. And sometimes our kids are that way. They don't. Eat. But, and, and I'm all for order and everything. But I'm just saying, folks, we've got to begin to know and understand that we really need God. Because our world is out of control. But me worried about it or having this insatiable appetite about every detail of it's not going to make it more controlled and it's likely to tip the scales to put me out of control and so you've got to weigh and measure and gauge yourself and ask God and say Lord give me grace upon grace when I'm weak I'm strong but I can't handle all this and he never told us to you know it just amazes me that I can touch on certain buttons with people and or they can touch with me and mean get fired up about something that I don't know anybody that's in it I just know what the news has said anybody here believe everything you hear on the news me neither. And sometimes I wonder, am I better off not knowing? But some of these things, people say to me, do you think it's the end? I said, I know it is. Paul said it was the end. That was 2,000 years ago. So we're in the end of the end. Depending on which part of the anatomy you're talking about, that's not very good, is it? You know, if you're clear, getting clear down there, man, this, is the, this might be the end of the trail here. Let alone, I don't know when the end of my life is, let alone when Jesus Christ is going to come back. But as far as I'm concerned, he can't come back soon enough. I'm done with the funerals. How about you? Let's just, Lord, come back and let's have one big one. Let's go. But uh, so be cautious and begin to understand, but don't lose track of God. And I want to encourage you, make sure you're on the light side of things, not just the right side, but the light side. So that as you're standing there, you can see your shadow, but you also see what all God's doing in front of you. And man, every day, I mean, it's like the old cliche, it's the present, you know, open it carefully and enjoy it. But don't be worried about yesterday or tomorrow. I was going to save this for Sunday, but I can't help but share it. Have any of you seen this commercial that I don't even remember which car it is right now or whatever, but they talked about even though that most uh, or less than 5% of the driving we do is in reverse. But it's like 50% of the accidents happen when people are backing up. And I listened to that and I thought, that's kind of weird, isn't it? Because you don't drive as fast in reverse. Uh, you don't go as many miles in reverse, but you're right, a lot of people. How many here are backed into anybody? See, that looks like it. Yeah, it's at least 50% here, right? Okay. And, and, but the part that was, you know, I was so in the spirit in the shower and, and heard that commercial, because we got TV in our bathroom, and I heard that commercial. Julie hated it, but she watches it every time now. But I uh, just got to give you that for what it's worth. Because she said, what do we want a TV in there for? And it's like, because it's just that way you can use your time, you know. And we do listen to Joyce Meyer. I mean, I feel a little weird being in the shower with Joyce Meyer on. But anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, so this is going on. And it's like, so I'm being very facetious here. Not about the TV in the shower and everything. But I'm being facetious about this spiritual moment. But. But it was, it was like, boom, just like that. I thought, God, isn't that the way we are? 
half of our life or half of the accidents in our life are because we're backing up. We're looking back here at the, what we've already been through and not looking ahead where we ought to be going. And, you know, we, we shouldn't be worried about the future, but you sure don't need to dwell in the past, do you? Uh, there's something about progressing, and there's something about enjoying God in the moment. So where did all that come from out of there? I have no idea other than the fact that that's what I see here is God's going ahead and shining, and he's putting darkness on the enemy so that he can confound them, and he's just waiting for the Christians to do something like Moses did and extend his staff and then waiting for the people to at least watch and get excited because somewhere along the line, I think God kind of likes for us to go ahead and go, woohoo, God. But not just because we won the lottery, but it's a woohoo when we see victories, whether it's somebody that's baptized or we hear a prayer that's answered that we don't forget or the prayers that he's answered for us. Or when we say, you know, I'm not even comfortable with the Lord's Prayer where it says, give us our daily bread. I'm kind of one of these that I like to say, God, I thank you for giving me my daily bread. I just, just don't want it to ever become a give it to me, God, you know, I'm afraid he might. Um, but I think we ought to be appreciative and see what all he's doing. So he's shining this way. Moses just went into gear. And Moses knows, all I did, I just stuck out the stick, you know. And God did the rest. But God did. But I wonder, had Moses not extended that, would anything have happened? I don't believe so. And in the meantime, what all these folks are focused on was back here. Oh, Pharaoh, the army, all those chariots. Yeah, what are we going to do? Jesus, bring us going to die. We could have been buried back home and died a nice slow death. And this is going to be terrible because we're going to be slaughtered out here. And so God darkens things back here. He said, look at this. So don't miss your future because you're looking back, okay, at your enemy. The ultimate enemy is Satan. Some of the enemies can be other people that have been in our lives, but don't spend all your time focusing on that. Look toward the future and see what God's doing for you. So he stretched out his hand, verse 21. All that night the Lord drove the sea back, a strong east wind, turned it into dry land. The waters were divided the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and their left. So they watch all this, and Moses says, come on now, let's go. They're like, they, weren't any, they hadn't ever seen an aquarium. They'd never think, seen thick enough glass to hold back water. Probably none of them had ever ridden in a glass-bottom boat even, you know, that way. And you're saying, come on. And Moses says, come on, let's go. And they found out that the ground was dry and i just wonder how far he pushed this sea back but suddenly it was a complete obstacle and going to be death for them there or death back here they're not having to swim they didn't have to put rafts together or nothing i know that's not good english but they didn't instead they walked through come on kids come on grandkids come on boss either bessie the cow let's go you know and so they start moving all their livestock all these people and the ones that look back couldn't see anything but the light because God was shining this way. You look back and it's like that. But he was shining darkness upon the Israel or the Egyptians. And while he was, he was confounding them as well. Verse 23, the Egyptians pursued them. All of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and the horsemen followed. It says all, all that he had followed them into the sea. Now don't forget, all the male horses that were firstborn had already died, right? All the soldiers that were the firstborn sons had already died. But what they had left, they're going. And guess what? They're all getting ready to die. But they pursued them. They followed them during the last watch of the night. One thing I read said that that's usually the time that they would try to attack, you know, when man, it, that real deep sleep sets in on you. But during the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire in the cloud at the Egyptian army, and he threw it into confusion. I think sometimes we think that that's what God's doing to us. And I think if he does, the only time he ever does it is if we're on a, uh, the wrong path. I think he'll try to mix us up some. I think that there is such a thing as that hedge of thorns that if we're reaching for the wrong thing and we get stuck so many times, we'll quit reaching maybe. Not because he's trying to punish us. He's trying to protect us. But here he's trying to protect them, and he is trying to because they're on a, on a dangerous journey. They're going against God. And uh, so he throws them into confusion. Now, I know that uh, in the book of Corinthians, Paul said our God is not a God of confusion, but a God of order. So when he's working this here, it's because he's trying to bring something about. At verse 25 says, he made the wheels of their chariots come off. One other uh, translation of that really says that he clogged them up so that they would drag. You know, they, suddenly that bearing wouldn't, 
I doubt they had bearings, but the wheel would lock up and it'd make it turn, you know, it'd spin and then even come off. And uh, so they had difficulty driving. The Egyptians began to get the message. They're superstitious enough and looking at it just logically and go, whoa. They'd never seen this black, a black cloud, and now this is happening, and they're remembering back about the Passover and the death and, and all those plagues and stuff, and notice the conclusion they came from or came away with. Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord's fighting for them and against us. Would you circle that for me? No, don't circle it for me. Circle it for you. The Lord's fighting for them. Circle and then, if you will, put a question mark out there. And is there any time in your life where your enemy that was pursuing you might stop in their tracks and go, I need to let this go because God's really working with them. See, that's why he says vengeance is his. He has a way of getting the attention that we could never do. I think sometimes when we set up plans and we, especially a fellow church member, even somebody that's from a different church, but you try to come against them, you ought to be a little bit spooked because God doesn't want us handling handling that part of somebody else's life. If you will, I, I want you to turn with me over to Romans 14. It's kind of a cool, not so cool passage here. I mean, the whole chapter is pretty amazing because it begins by talking about recognizing faith. First verse of Romans 14 is, Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. So what's really funny is, and I've mentioned to you before, a lot of people say, God said, don't judge. And he said, just don't judge carelessly because he tells us to make judgments. And that's what he does right here. Is he, he says, accept him whose faith is weak. Well, how do you know that unless you look and with insight and maybe prayer, you begin to put in perspective and go, I forgot, they're a pretty new Christian, aren't they? That's somebody whose faith is weak. There are also people that maybe been Christians for years as far as churchgoers, but there's not a lot of depth because they've not been shared the word. There are a lot of churches that don't teach the Bible. They just teach church doctrine or platitudes and philosophies and different things that way. So there are judgments we make. The other part of Jesus' teaching was, just remember, though, as you're making some assessments and judgments, though, know that the way you judge others is the way I will judge you. I got into a deal where somebody asked me, Tony Stewart, you know, he hit that guy. What do you think? I said, I think I wasn't there. I said, I've got an opinion just because of other things I've seen, but I don't want to pretend like me and Tony are just like this and I know how to judge him. I said, I would tell you from what I've seen, I don't believe it in any way that he thought I'm going to kill this guy. But I said, I think like any of us, that sometimes when you're in the midst of a testosterone contest, you kind of push it to the limit. And I don't know if you ever played the game chicken. You know what I'm talking about when you run at each other and who's going to be the first to, to lose? It's the guy that doesn't swerve that usually loses, right? And somehow or another, you're bigger and better because you didn't swerve, ha, ha, ha. Well, I mean, that's just not really a good brainiac game, but my brother and I used to do it on bicycles and we did it on motorcycles and never did it in the car deal, man. I mean, I thought a motorcycle was safe. <laughs> that was bright, wasn't it? But uh, anyway, we, they asked me to make this judgment. That's the only thing that came through my mind is, man, if I'd say something here, God's going to use whatever I use to weigh and measure my assessment of him. So in that regard, it's better not to judge because you don't have all the tools to make the judgment with. But God says you do have some tools, and then you've got the Spirit of God, and you've got compassion because you're a child of God. Use it because our God is what? Gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding love. Be that kind of person. So as you do, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. What's a disputable matter? matter it's um it's this stuff that you know when you major in minors it's one of these things it's kind of like the rule that i was brought up with in our church was where the bible speaks we'll speak where the bible's silent just shut up the bible doesn't speak about every single thing it tells us about the things we need to know but churches usually argue over what every single thing and a lot of it's not in there 
I mean, I'm sure I could start a pretty good contest tonight with, hey, it's okay for a Christian to drink, right? Don't, don't answer that, just, you know, but I'm just saying I could throw that. That's a disputable matter because the Bible doesn't say. It says don't get drunk. What about smoking? It doesn't say one thing about smoking. I mean, I knew I grew up with the I don't smoke, I don't chew, and I don't go with girls who do, but, you know, the Bible didn't say that. Somebody told me that. Now am I saying, so go do it? I didn't say that. I said just where it speaks, let's speak, and where it doesn't, it's between them and God. Read on with me, and you'll see what I'm saying. It says, because one man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man that eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man that doesn't eat must not condemn the man that does. Wow. You think he's just talking about meat and vegetables there, or could it be talking about these other social issues that a lot of churches like to get involved in? Like I said, to me, if the Bible said it, that would be different. And somebody would go, well, your body is the temple of God. Yeah, and how much coffee and sugar did you drink today? And how many of those Snicker bars? What about that milkshake at the Dairy Queen? I mean, where do you quit if your body's the temple of God? I like that. I heard about that one guy that wrote the book. If uh, my body's a temple of God, then I've got a mega church. <laughs> Uh, he's a biggie in the brotherhood, you know. <laughs> uh, there's more than one way, right? But, but anyway, I mean, it's, it's weird how folks will get strung out. And, and, and I think if you really look at it, you see Jesus up there going, oh, I'm so proud of you standing up for what you believe is right, even though it's not a biblical issue. <laughs> no, I think it's the devil going, watch this. I'll get them at each other's throats. And they'll never speak to each other again, or they'll always go, well, they think it's okay to do this, you know? Man, just look at what it says here. Man, he said, the one that doesn't shouldn't condemn the one that does, and the one that does shouldn't condemn the one that doesn't. Seems pretty easy to me. What do you think? Kindergarten stuff, right? And it goes on, says, uh, you know, the man that doesn't eat must not condemn the man that does, for God has accepted him. That's a good part to circle. God has accepted him. And until he gives you the job to correct him or the scripture, then let God deal with him. And notice verse 4. This one's pretty impactful. He says, who are you to judge someone else's servant? Now, that brings up the judgment thing. But I, I think what's even more interesting about that is, is remembering, like I used to tell my sister, you're not my boss. That's the fun about being, you know, growing up with multiple brothers and sisters, right? You can say stuff like that. You hear stuff like that. You learn how to use stuff like that. But that's what he's saying. Paul's saying, you're not his boss. Who is? Yep. Man, we forget, don't we? That's part of what this weekend is about with the guys' retreat is responsibility and authority. We spend too much of our time taking responsibility for things we were never given the authority to do. And we don't spend enough time being responsible for the things that God told us to do. And we wonder why we get miserable. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? Anybody got an answer to that? Because the Bible is full of questions and we go, hmm, that's a good question. Do you ever answer it? I, I got an answer for me. Nobody. I'm a nobody to judge God's servant. In other words, I need to take a step back and go, sorry, Lord. To his own master, he stands or falls. And he'll stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. I don't like that verse. I don't like letting people off the hook. I don't like this, you know, freewheeling, da, 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 you can do anything. But until God gives me the job, whew, one less thing on my plate I have to worry about, right? But you're a pastor. Yeah, until it becomes a biblical issue. And even then, I don't like looking at it until it's so far in my face that I can't ignore it, you know? And the, so there are responsibilities that God's given me and the leadership to, to do, but, man, it's not about getting involved in every little thing. And it goes back to my illustration about the news. You know, not only do we get caught up in the world events and taking our sides and opinions and Tony Stewart, is he guilty of this or that, but then we bring it in, and that's what's dangerous. That's what I'm saying. 
the reason it's not like I think it's unchristian to watch the news. I watch the news, but I got to be careful that it doesn't make me unchristian, right? But the worst thing is, is that it doesn't make me critical because I'm not supposed to be. I'm supposed to be compassionate. And there are very few critical people that are compassionate, right? The critical tend to be the ones that will slice your neck for you. You know, to put you in your place. I like this. I mean, I think it's healthy. I think, wow. And the whole thing is God saying, you know, you got all these things you're worried about. Well, first of all, I didn't put them on your shoulder or your plate or in your knapsack or whatever else you're carrying around or your purse. So why don't you unload a little bit here? It's the airport rule. What's it say? Don't leave your bags unattended and don't pick up somebody else's. I think they got that from the Bible. Just leave it alone, right? And so I look at this and you go, what's this got to do with back here? What difference does it make if it has nothing to do with back there? But I think that what it has to do with is this whole thing with the Israelites that are paranoid about the Egyptians and the Egyptians finally begin to get a little paranoid about them. And all I'm coming down to is when you and I stand for God and we stand not as a God, but on behalf of him. And when we get concerned about the things God's concerned about and lose all these other things that we aren't even asked to be concerned about, we will begin to get to the point of victory in our lives that we will experience where his deliverance has come about in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, with our, everything about us, our health and finances and everything in between. We will get delivered, folks. And then our enemies, as well as even our friends or the unbelieving friends that we've got, will begin to look at us and go, you know what? God's on their side. That's the part that I'm afraid the world misses out on. Because when we're critical and judgmental and we, we pick up our little issues that we grind to pieces on things and, you know, we're going to wear somebody out and God didn't give you the job of wearing anybody out, you're not going to look victorious because you can't be. You're so busy being defeated and defeating others to make yourself feel better that you still don't feel good and the world looks at you and go, what a sourpuss Christian, man. They must have had the pickle juice in the baptistry the day they went down, you know, because it's just like, and man, I used to think that's what Christians look like, you know, puckered up and, you know, just sour all the time. And it's like, man, come on, be a Christian with me, you know, prune face, pucker face, whatever you want to be. I better be careful because I'll go on from there. I'll say something <laughs> wrong, but, but you know, I mean, it's like, it's ridiculous, Especially when you're free, what do you do? You fly. You're not grounded. I mean, you're grounded in the good ways, but you, you can elevate. God can move you because you've learned to relax in him. Doesn't mean you don't care. It's just you've learned there are things that you should care about. And the biggest one being is giving him thanksgiving, experiencing and giving him glory so that the world begins to look like at you like, man, God is on your side I won't come up against them. The, the enemy stay away just because it's like, you got the high pro glow and I'm not gonna mess with that. But some of the unbelievers will start to come close to you because they want some of what you've got. But if you turn around and show them a sour attitude, it's not gonna endear them to God. So you begin to see, so let's, let's read on here. I mean, is this wasting anybody's time or not? Is, it, is this hitting anybody where they live? Two, come on, you liars. You know, I can make that judgment. The Bible does say don't lie. I don't believe for one moment that none of you have any judgmental bones in your butt. None of you have any sour. I don't believe for one moment that nobody in this room besides me and Carol may have any problems with focusing on other people and the things of the world and getting critical. Come on. I think we do need to look at this. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one, and this is so cool, so practical, should be fully convinced in his own mind. Because that's what you're going to be judged by. What were you convinced about, Steve? Well, I was thinking about, uh, you know, Lindsay and Mike, and, you know, what were you convinced of? Well, isn't that weird? What would cause us to do that? Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so I love this. To the Lord. Novel idea. To the Lord. 
That's how it's supposed to be. You and I live for God. And if somebody else lives differently, that's between them and their master, God. Okay, he regards one day as special, does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, and he abstains, does so to the Lord, and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone. Now, this is equally important, though. None of us lives to himself alone. None of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. He owns us, which goes right back up to his own master. If you're a Christian, the Lord is your master. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. For this reason, Christ died. What reason? So that he could be our master. So that sin would no longer have its mastery over us. So that we could be freed from the way we've always thought in our critical thinking. And we can enjoy life and that we can live for God. Even in the midst of terrible circumstances and desperate situations. We can still live to God. That we can make choices with our life. And whether we watch TV or we don't even have a TV. Make that choice, but do it to the Lord. There's nothing like a Christian that decides to do something God told them to do, but they're not going to feel very good about it until everybody else joins them. Because they want you to go, oh, man, that's really a, you know, I'll tell you what, when J.J. said that he gave up everything but water for a year, I was impressed. But I was really thankful God didn't tell me that's what I ought to do. <laughs> but I was impressed that he did it. Water on cereal, man, because no milk, no nothing. I'm like, come on, God will give you a pass on Nope. I said I was going to do nothing but water. Wow. You know, so we can be impressed with things, but we've got to be careful. And we don't need to be doing it to try to impress upon others. We do it to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died, returned to life, so that, we might, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Why do you look down on your brother? For we'll all stand before God's judgment seat. The word, if I recall right there, is bima, and uh, it's like the judge's bench. We'll all pass before God's judgment. You stand before it. And it's written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So in other words, what Paul's implying here is, so with that in mind, do you really have enough time to be over here looking at other people's business and deciding whether or not they're living in the spirit or not living in the spirit or should you maybe be looking at your own life and going, God, I want to do everything I do to you, to you, to you, to the Lord, because you bought me. Therefore, let's start passing judgment on one another. Instead, how about this? Make up your mind not to put a stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Don't move the furniture on a blind person. That's what it's saying. Don't go trying to set people up to fall. No. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I'm fully convinced that no food's unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something unclean, then for him it's unclean. If your brother's distressed because of what you eat, do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. But that's what Christians like to argue about. But it is one. The kingdom of God is all about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Anyone that serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. In other words, I think what that's saying there is that's when people will begin to believe, man, you've got God on your side. And that's the part that I loved about back here with the Egyptians. Man, they suddenly come to the conclusion God is fighting for them. And so the whole point of all that was in regard to live in such a way that your neighbors, your friends, any unbeliever that you know, if they watch you, they're going to say, man, God is really on their side. But it doesn't happen because nothing wrong ever happens to you. It happens because even in the midst of wrong, you don't allow it to overwhelm you. You don't allow it to turn you sour. You don't allow it to bring cursing from your mouth. And it's not that it's like, oh, well, this is just great. It's just, you know, man, say a prayer for me because the Lord's got a plan. I can't see what it is right now, but I know one thing. He works everything to good. Eventually, it will work out that way. So back to this so I can say that we did finish up Exodus 14, okay? So the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand. Here we go again. Waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. Because why? Because God said, if you're the creator, it has to obey. The sea was God's dog. He told him to part 
and do something un completely unusual, unnatural, impossible by physics. And then he told it, he spoke again, and it went right back into place. I never was good at it, but tried playing with yo-yos. Anybody here? I'm not talking about the person that I know. I'm talking about, you know, the, the little toy thing, you know? And there are people, man, walk the dog, do whatever, all these tricks and stuff like that. And sometimes it's like, golly, I don't have that much time. But I'm impressed, but, you know, so what? But I just didn't have that much coordination. But a yo-yo goes out, and it does what? It comes back when it's working right. And it's all with that continuing the spin, right? As long as it continues that gyration, you know, the gyroscoping action, it has this tendency to come back. And what I want you to know is that we can be God's yo-yo. He can send us out, he can send us back. If the Spirit's working in us, we continue to gyrate or generate this motion, and it stays in place. We don't react one way or the other because we know who the Master is that's controlling it. Sometimes God does that with the weather around us. Man, we can get all upset. Oh, it's a warning, warning, and all. Or we can go, God, I'm sure glad you're the one that's in charge of the weather. And I'm just saying, folks, there's so many more things we can relax about when we really begin to believe that God is large and in charge. And if he's large enough and in charge enough to take the sea and to part it, they walk through four million people possibly up to that on dry ground. And then his timing is just supreme. They know more than get across. And the Israelites in their confusion, in spite of the chariots, wheels coming off or whatever else, they're still pursuing and, you know, it's like that witched, wicked witch of the West and Wizard of Oz. I can't even do that little music that's behind him, you know. But she's riding like crazy on that bicycle and uh, going to get the little pretty and, and all this stuff. But, you know, that's the way the enemy pursues us. And if you're with God, you can hit the panic button or you can just go ahead and enjoy the peace. They walk through and they get over there. Like I said, man, can you imagine admiring the fish that you could see and the water that would stack up twice as high at least as what the Red Sea was before? The amazing thing about the dry ground, or you can walk through in paranoia going, oh, what am I doing? But man, the people that walked through and praised God in the midst of it enjoyed it. And as they get out, here come the Egyptians. And it's still not like just because they made it through that that's okay until God slams a door shut on them. And it was just wide enough there that this whole Egyptian army got in the water and they're coming at them, and then somebody starts getting that feeling like, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is one of those deals. And they're trying to turn around and go back, but it's too late. Moses stretched out his hand again, verse 27, at daybreak the sea went back into its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, really away from it. They're going back, they're trying to, suddenly they realize that's not our enemy, it's this water. God did this for them, but now it's not going to work for us. And it said that before they could turn around and head back out of this, this riverbed, uh, the sea was closed and it swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them, not one survived. Not one of them could swim that well. Not even the horses but the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and their left. And that day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel, on top of it all, God gave them proof. And it's kind of gross, but all these bodies washed up on shore on their side so that they could see them. What had Moses told them earlier? He said, do not be afraid, in verse 13, stand firm and you'll see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You just need to stand still. And that stillness there isn't just the, it's that be at peace. Be still before God and know that he's Lord. Say, so now he gives him proof. And when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and Moses and his servant. The only thing that I'm not going to promise you is I may touch back on that because how many of you, when was the last time you heard anything about the fear of the Lord where you really studied it? Because I'd like to share some of the things that the Bible has to say about the fear of the Lord and we don't have time tonight. So uh, possibly next week, we'll just see what God wants to do. But anyway, so there's the picture. What I wish I could tell you was, end of the story, and from then on, God and the Israelites lived happily ever after. But anybody that's read any of the Bible knows what? 
it didn't last very long till they were complaining, moaning, and groaning again because they started taking their knapsack and their purses and whatever else they could carry and going back and consuming themselves with things that weren't theirs to do instead of just enjoying God. When I say enjoying God, I don't mean to imply the fact that every one of my days just goes so swell. It's swell, beaver. It's swell. No, man, it doesn't. All I'm saying is when I put things in perspective, it is swell. It's swell with my soul. Like Fanny Crosby, a lady that was blind, sings about one of my faith shall be made sight. Wow. That's somebody that believed, wasn't it? And how a blind lady could write songs like that, it's phenomenal to me. But she wrote them with such conviction. It didn't impair her. She just saw God that much better because she couldn't miss the, miss the light even in the midst of the dark eyes that she had. And she was looking forward to something that was yet to come. I hope you are too. I hope that you'll consider giving up uh, some of the things maybe that you've carried that God didn't ask you to carry, that you'll consider about, man, how many of the things that I get upset about with others are even scriptural, that you, God would remind us all that, man, did I put you as their boss? Or is he still their master? Questions, comments?